Thanks, Katie. Uh, I do want to thank Katie and the rest of the PRSSA board. Um, they handled uh, most of the logistics for this evening. Uh, they were quite supportive of the department in agreeing to co-sponsor uh, a topic that's not necessarily uh, exactly public relations, but certainly impacts public relations, and that's uh, the impact of changing technology uh, on news organizations in particular and on business uh, in general. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Scott Miller, the Dean of our School of Business, for attending, and Mike Hannon, our Provost. Uh, Dr. Hannon also generously provided uh, financial support to assist with travel, uh, as did the Student Government Association, and it was not me, it was our PRSSA board that was solely responsible for working with SGA to obtain that. So again, I appreciate it. Um, I guess I've, people tell me that once you become a department chair, most of what you do, you do two things with the rest of your life. You attend a lot of meetings and you spend a lot of time introducing people. Attending meetings is one of the things I like least about being a department chair. Introducing people is one of the things I like most. So I'm going to get right at it. Um, on my left, or on my right rather, uh, is Jim Grillo. Uh, what I want to tell you about Jim Grillo is that two or three years ago, for the first time ever, our former department launched uh, an alumni fundraising initiative. And the communication media, or now called the Friends of Communication Wall of Fame in the hall, uh, alumni uh, donated plaques and we put their name on. And more than a fundraising initiative, it was to show all the great things that our graduates are doing. The first response that came back, it just said, Jim Grillo, 1975 graduate, CEO, the Cricket Group. And uncharacteristically of me, I didn't immediately follow up with him. I waited about a year and then it was killing me. Who is Jim Grillo and what is the Cricket Group? And when I found out, um, we, I met him this summer when he was back in Northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, where he comes back still frequently to visit his mom who still lives in Warren and we met and we talked about this event and when I asked him to participate he, he responded just as quickly he said sure I'll do it and I guarantee you this evening you're going to learn a lot more about Jim Grillo and the cricket group but I can tell you um, it, it's it's not an exaggeration to describe him as a cable television Pioneer. He's worked for some of the largest cable companies, not just here in the United States, he's worked in countries uh, all around the world, and you're going to find more out about that tonight. Next to Jim Grillo is uh, a guy named Kevin Klepps. Uh, back when Kevin and I were both a lot younger and a little happier, uh, I was his faculty advisor. Uh, I'll, I won't say I was one of his favorite professors, but he was one of my favorite students. And I always knew Kevin was destined for very good things. He's the kind of guy that you not only, not only know is going to succeed, but he's a great guy and you want to see him succeed. Uh, he's had a very successful career in sports journalism. He started with the Meadville Tribune, moved to the Daily Newspaper in Willoughby, Ohio, where he was steadily promoted. Uh, up to the position of assistant sports editor, and then he made a really significant career move. Well, he didn't really leave sports journalism, but he moved into the world of business journalism. And he is the assistant editor of Crane's Cleveland Business, which is the leading business publication uh, catering to uh, executives in the Cleveland area. Kevin's retained his sports tie because he writes a blog called Sports Biz, and I don't think anyone covers the business aspects of Cleveland's professional sports scene better than Kevin. And maybe Vanessa is going to get him to talk about Johnny Manziel and LeBron James tonight. Maybe. I don't know. But we're delighted to have uh, Kevin back as well. Next to Kevin is a gentleman named Brett Pooley. The only person on the panel who doesn't happen to be a graduate of Edinburgh University. But I met Brett a couple of summers ago at a Scripps Howard uh, sponsored journalism leadership academy that was uh, in Baton, Baton Rouge. It was hosted by the Manship School of Journalism and Mass Communication at LSU. And, uh, you know, 
the first night we were there, they had a dinner for us and everyone's sort of looking around and they have you introduce yourself. And I was looking across the room and I was like, that dude does not look like an academic to me. The, who is that guy? Who's the best dressed guy in this place? There's just something about him that, that sets him apart. Well, one of the things that set him apart is that was the very beginning of his career as an academic because he's probably, his history is that he's probably one of the country's top business and financial journalists. When he introduced himself, his resume reads like one you would fabricate. Wall Street Journal, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize at the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, most recently covered the media industry for Bloomberg, also owned and operated an entertainment website in New York City, connecting customers to items related everything related to culture and entertainment in New York City. And, and he wouldn't say this, but I'll say it for him. He was one of Hampton University's star journalism graduates, and Hampton's president wooed him from Manhattan in big time financial journalism and got him to come back to his alma mater as dean of their journalism school. And I told him when we left that academy, I said, Brett, you're not going to remember who I am, but I'm going to tell you something about me. I am going to find the appropriate event, and I am going to bring you to Edinburgh University. What do most people do when you say something like that, when a year later you follow up with them? For me, most people ignore my phone calls and emails. That's what most people do. What did Brett Pooley do? Just like Jim Grillo hopped on a plane in Denver to fly here, Brett Pooley hopped on a plane in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and, and flew here. And I, I think that's equally classy. Next to Brett is the woman I'm going to turn this evening over to. She's a, another one of our distinguished graduates. Some of you may, you know, she's so young, some of our current students or graduate students may actually remember her. But Vanessa Herring, she was one of the leaders of ETV. ETV is here recording the event tonight. After she graduated, she was hired by Lilly Broadcasting in Erie, first as a producer, then as a reporter, then as their uh, primary anchor on the CBS affiliate. Uh, she then moved to WROC in Rochester. And she very recently, in just the last few months, made a quantum leap in her career, which is particularly impressive uh, for someone of her age. She moved from Rochester, New York, to WUSA 9, the CBS affiliate in Washington, D.C. And you don't need to be a broadcast journalism expert to know that that's quite a career leap. We're very proud of Vanessa. We're very proud of her success. And again, we're delighted that she hopped on a plane and fought delays uh, and still got here to moderate this this evening. And so, you know, I work with all women, Vanessa, on the PRSSA board. They're exclusively female, you know? So I wanted to ask him, I wanted to say pop quiz. When you put together a topic like this and you put three of the smartest guys that you can find, what's the one thing you need? I said, you got to go find the smartest, toughest woman to come in and ask the questions and keep them all in line. So Vanessa, with that, with that, take it over. Iron Fist, okay. Um, so, well, first, I just kind of want to let everyone tell our audience a little bit more about your background and kind of how you've seen the media landscape change during your career. So, why don't we start with you, Brett? Sure. Um, well, I can um, tell you, I think, um, jumping off where Tony uh, just left off as he talked a bit about my career, I um, uh, as, as Tony pointed out, spent many years covering media and entertainment. So in addition to working at some of the places that you mentioned, which are certainly some very formidable uh, um, uh, publications and media outlets um, in their own right, I also for many, many years was, was covering the industry uh, for these places. So as, uh, as the disruption that you all no doubt know so much about that is a result of the proliferation of digital platforms and digital media is that disruption really took place and took hold uh, over the years. I was observing that from both perspectives, from that perspective of someone working in the industry, but also from the perspective of someone who was covering the industry. And one thing that, uh, uh, that 
became really apparent to me, in addition to, as, as Tony pointed out, my president at the university, I should say also during those years, I was serving on the board of trustees at the university, which at Hampton, which is my undergrad alma mater. And our president had uh, started uh, working on me uh, to consider becoming the dean there uh, once my predecessor had announced his retirement. And it was a really a non-starter initially. It was something I just wasn't going to consider because I was very much immersed in my career. My family was, was very much entrenched in, in the New York City area. And um, so I told him thanks, but no thanks. And, and he returned every six months because he's a very persistent guy, very successful uh, president, and finally got me to, to give it uh, 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 some real consideration. And I got my family to do the same. But I'll tell you, that I tell that story because in addition to his persuasiveness, the thing that really, uh, I think, sealed the deal for me was as I observed this industry, and the changes that were taking place and this irrevocable disruption taking place, uh, it became so apparent to me that it, this is what I think is the most extraordinary time uh, um, in the history of, of media. And, and what I mean by that is I think it's an extraordinary time for, for young people especially. There is so much opportunity that is a result of this world of opportunity, uh, this, this world of disruption. You know, when I came along and when I was at this stage, there were gatekeepers out there. And if you did not go through the gatekeepers, you didn't work in media. Well, of course, now the gatekeepers, the big traditional companies, uh, are, uh, there's a lot of consternation at those places because of this disruption. But the, the wonderful thing is that it's all wide open and we don't all, no one really knows where it's going to, where things will sort of uh, settle down. But what we know is that it will get figured out. And, and what I mean by that is how we monetize on these platforms, how we use these platforms to gather news and distribute news at pro in profitable ways will all get figured out. And it will get figured out by, you know who, people like the students who are right here. And so that's what really encouraged me to do what I'm doing now, was to play a role in really fostering for our students what I think is very much instinctive and, and fostering uh, uh, the kind of environment where they can play a role in pioneering the future of this industry. Thank you. Kevin? Well, unlike uh, Brett, I do not have a Pulitzer nomination. But <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of time. <laughs> but I love when I left Edinburgh in the mid-90s, I started as, my, my internship before I graduated was with the Meadville Tribune. And I wasn't sure if it's what I wanted to do, but it just, once I started covering sports and I started going to high school football games and I got a couple Steelers assignments, I was hooked. And I just, I love that as aspect of just kind of just being the eyes and ears of certain people who followed what you did. And I remember when I first started, there were two computers in the newsroom that had the internet. They were, they were <laughs> off in the corner. So if, any, if you needed to check anything or you wanted to see what was going on, you went to this, these two computers in the corner that had the internet. The rest of the newsroom did not have any internet at all. So it just, the, the transformation since then is obviously unbelievable. Everything's in real time. If you're a writer, you're expected to, you're basically writing four different stories before you're done. I mean, you have to, you're expected to tweet while you're covering something. You're, I mean, some guys are updating their Facebook pages. It just, it's so much, the transformation just in the last 10 years, let alone 20, is just absolutely amazing. And the more, the more things you can do, the more, just the more aspects that you're involved in and the more things that you, you, you don't even have to be, be an expert at them. Just be good at a bunch of different things. That's the best advice I can give anyone is just the more things you can do, the more valuable, the more valuable you are. Because as these, as certain newsrooms shrink, as certain companies shrink, I mean, if you can do more things, that you're more of an asset to them than somebody else. That would be the best piece of advice I can give anyone. Good advice. <laughs> Jim? Um, I, I'm presently tweeting the attendance of this uh, <laughs> event. Um, so therefore, I am uh, gathering the news, I'm editing the news, I'm distributing the news, 
think I'll take a selfie of myself. <laughs> and, I, and I am the news. Um, if, if any of you see an interview with a celebrity sports figure, a politician, you, you'll note that what's in front of their face is not a microphone. It's a, it's a cell phone. The journalists use their cell phones to, um, to, to work their job. Um, and I, I can only say that when I was an Edinburgh student, um, and that was a long time ago. I think I'm the oldest one on the panel. Um, when I was an Edinburgh student, I was uh, also working part-time for Channel 12, WICU, um, directing the weekend news. But they gave me a camera. And this camera was that size camera, but it held film. And um, if there was news that was taking place in the Edinburgh area, they'd call me and, and, and say, uh, hey, Jim, go out and shoot this accident or whatever which I would do, uh, and I also covered some basketball games and you know, brought the scores back, but which I would do, and it took, I don't know, hours, uh, because I went out, I shot it, I took it, I drove it back to, to Erie and came back, and, and, um, uh, and they then processed that film. So, I mean, if you think not even so much from that time, and that wasn't a whole lot different. They, they changed from, uh, from film to, to tape to uh, discs. Um, but at the same time, uh, that was up until uh, maybe, oh, as little as six or seven years ago. But the ad, not just the advent of the internet, but online opportunities and digitization of equipment um, that allowed for much greater bandwidth. And that's the business I'm in. I'm in cable television. I'll explain in a minute, I'll answer your question about who I am, but um, it is, it gives you journalists so much capability, um, it also gives you huge challenges, and you know, we can talk about that. Um, to answer the first part of your question, I'm a cable guy, not, not the cable guy, <laughs> but, but a cable guy. Um, I've been in the business for 30 years. Uh, I've started building networks uh, and marketing cable services. Uh, in Rochester, New York. Um, it uh, has changed tremendously in terms of our ability to uh, purchase programming, uh, to determine what people want, um, to uh, sell different aspects of the network, uh, and to be involved in internet and then uh, telephone uh, from the time that, um, that it started. Uh, and it started uh, long before I joined the business in places like this, uh, it was called CAT, Community Antenna Television, and it was a, it was a uh, tower on the top of the hill, and it beamed down the television stations from Erie or Buffalo or wherever, wherever it could go. Uh, I've uh, fortunately been able to move into international uh, cable work, which I've done for the last 15 years, um, and as, uh, as up until about seven years ago, I was working for Liberty Global, um, in uh, different countries and in development, and uh, uh, these days I have my own company and work for any number of of uh, companies. But um, my my uh, role in in this panel tonight is, I think, to speak of that aspect of uh, the media business. So I want to touch on something that you talked about, and I want to kind of ask everyone here, as far as social media goes, how many people have a Facebook page? Instagram, Twitter, Vine. Okay, less hands for Vine. Anything else? Anything? Any other ones I'm missing? Any Snapchat. Other Snapchat. Pinterest. 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 <laughs> Tumblr. Tumblr. <laughs> so as far as those things go, I mean, it seems like somebody, everyone has a little bit of something that you may check daily, weekly, maybe by the minute <laughs> when it comes to Twitter and things like that. How has that, from each of your perspectives, changed the way um, media is delivered? Because that's something that's becoming more important to companies now, is who is watching, <laughs> who's watching these pages? You can, you can all jump in where you feel comfortable. Um, I'll take a shot at it. No, you're absolutely right. It, 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 it has impacted um, 
the ability to distribute news and information and um, individuals are capable of really creating their own brands and distribution platforms as a result of this. Also something else that comes to mind, you mentioned companies and I think this will resonate uh, especially with the public relations majors. Uh, you have the uh, PRSSA students uh, sponsoring. One of the things that is, is really growing uh, in corporate America is something that you hear it referred to in different ways. The most recent term I heard was the one that has stuck with me and that's what's called the creative newsroom. And what is happening is, is a number of cor corporations, particularly large corporations, because they can access their uh, constituents, they can access an audience without having to place a story as they used to call it with mainstream media. They can now go directly to, uh, uh, speak directly to their consumers with news. They now have their own newsrooms. And uh, for example, I was at an event this summer and uh, the gentleman who runs corporate communications at GE, one of the biggest companies in the world, they just hired uh, one of the great reporters from the Wall Street Journal. Not to be a public relations professional per se, which is what typically has happened over the years when a person leaves the journalism profession and goes to, as we used to say, the dark side. <laughs> but I don't think it's so much the dark side now. I think there's this sort of hybrid profession that's taking place that's kind of in the middle. And so they hired this guy to write stories every day about General Electric. I mean, to write real stories and, 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 and to, they conduct uh, um, uh, budget meetings every day, just like a regular news operation, a TV station or a newspaper. And they write the stuff and they distribute the stuff and a lot of it's video, et cetera. So, and this is something that is apparently becoming pretty pervasive. And some of you may have heard about native content. Some people call it native content. Um, uh, there are a couple of terms. It's, what, it's almost what we used to call advertorials, but advertorials were more blatant kind of advertising, right, mixed in with, with editorial. But now there's a growth, a real, a, a real uh, a proliferation of this native content. And again, it's stuff that is produced by companies and paid for uh, uh, with those corporate dollars. But uh, it requires a real, uh, it requires pretty uh, strong set of skills, journalistic skills to produce that stuff. And again, this is a result to, you know, in, in, in response to your question, this is because people don't have to go through gatekeepers anymore because they can distribute their own news and information. Companies are doing that. To piggyback off what Brett said, uh, the Cleveland Browns have two full-time writers. I mean, these are guys who were legitimate journalists who now work for the Cleveland Browns. They have a two-hour daily radio show, and those guys are both on that. They write for the website. They have, the website has its own video channel where they're appearing on there, and so they're, they're basically TV guys, uh, writers, and radio hosts, and that's, what, that's the way it is now. I mean, these teams have, not every team, but the teams that are smart about it, they're their own media companies. They, yes. they have their own video channel. The Browns have a video channel that you can actually subscribe to. And they have places on their site where they have fresh content every hour of the day. And that's just the way it is now. Some of these teams are actually their own media entities. But regarding news breaking, I mean, where does, anytime you guys see a big story, where do you go first? You probably see a break on Twitter, don't you? I mean, just the way it is now. It just, it never, before you used to write a story in, you would either break it in print the next day or maybe you'd break it on your website later. But now, when you have a scoop, the first thing you're doing is tweeting it. That's, that's just right. the way, I mean, that's, it's the way it is now. And that's, I mean, it, it's the best, if you're looking for information and you're covering a beat and you want to see what's going on, the first place I go now is Twitter. Because it enables you to get a headline out so fast. You know, 25 years ago, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and we had what we called the, the um, what do we call it, the speed desk or something like that. But the point is that there, were, there was always a unit in every Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal Bureau. There, there was a daily unit of people who were dedicated to just getting headlines out, right? Whenever a company would report anything on the wires, the idea was to get the headline out as fast as possible 
because we were competing early on 25 years ago to get the loyalty of people in financial services. So, the, the, and they trade on that information. So if they get that headline that says, you know, Disney earnings up 20%, whatever, the faster they get it, uh, or the, the company they get it the fastest from is the one that they're going to depend on the most, right? So that's now what's happening everywhere across all media and these new platforms such as Twitter enable you. That's essentially what people are doing. What we did 25 years ago, we sent a headline out on the wires. Well, now everyone's sending a headline out when they tweet. I mean, oh, yeah. Twitter is teaching everyone to write headlines. Yeah. Yeah. There is, uh, you know, in, in, in my industry, I think um, most programming services, especially news programming services, um, obviously see this as the direction that, that people are going, um, and, and certainly youth is going, um, and, you know, recognize they're left behind if they don't move in that direction. Um, so um, I, I uh, called a, a good friend uh, who's now a senior executive at, at CNN before this panel, because my skill set is certainly not news news gathering, um, but they are uh, uh, I, they developed in 2011. I report. Does anyone know? I report. I report for all intents and purposes is a site you go to. Um, I I don't honestly know whether it's on the CNN.com site or whether it is is its own, uh, but. You, any, anyone here could go to that site and submit a report. Uh, and shortly after it was developed in 2000, and, and, and you know, they're not going to pay you for it, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, uh, and they will vet it to make sure that, uh, that it, it, it is uh, legitimate news. Uh, but um, very shortly after they developed iReport, uh, there was the Virginia Tech shootings. Uh, and they got that piece of video from someone, some student, we, I presume, cell phone, uh, in, uh, in, in this case, they say hours before the local broadcast outlets um, or anyone in that area uh, had any real uh, information on that. You know, so, so that's kind of part one. But part, part two is um, since they recognize that people are going are using social media and you know we'll probably get into this later in the conversation which is um, who pays for what um, uh, they've also developed a um, a site called CNN go you have to be a cable or satellite subscriber to go to CNN go but it's a much more vibrant site in terms of um, the use of uh, videos and social media and, and the, your ability to pull uh, your news from that, um, but they, you know, they recognize that their industry of reporting news um, has uh, has gone in a different direction. So, when we talk about the digital platform, how many of you uh, will go to a station website instead of reading the newspaper or even watching the news? How many of you use a computer to go to that website? And how many of you use your phone? Phones computers like actually type it in so both <laughs> right so um, so the next thing I, I kind of want to talk about is just the importance of those websites I know working in a newsroom a lot of times you may come back especially if it's a fluffy story um, and your news director will say okay that's great but what do you have for the web what's a web exclusive what can we tell people they can only see on our website to get them to go there how important are these websites and design and technology becoming, especially the mobile platforms, ease of use with the viewers or the subscribers? Uh, how important do you see that becoming to companies? I think it's huge. I mean, that's, it's if you cool. don't have an interactive mobile website, you're, I mean, you're going to lose a ton of traffic. It's gotten to the point now where a lot of websites, at least the ones that I know of, <laughs> you're getting at least a quarter of your page views from mobile traffic, and I'm sure that's good. They're projecting. It's, I think it's going to be over 50% at some point soon. It just that's what the younger generation is doing. They're reading on their phones and they're reading on their tablets. So you have to. Most of the websites now, or at least the good ones, are interactive, where you can. It uh, when you're looking at your phone, you, it's going to. It knows that you're on a mobile and it's going to transform its site for you. So, and if you don't have that, you're. 
people aren't going to go back and you're going to lose an audience. It's, it's crucial, absolutely crucial. Yeah, I think your, your informal poll just a few seconds ago underscores how critical it is that people, everyone's going to those sites via mobile or via their laptops or desktops to, to access news and information. Every, we all know that there are places where we can get things fast and we don't have to wait until the broadcast comes on at noon or the broadcast comes on at, at 5 or 5.30 or whatever may be the case. Uh, and your editor is asking for something, what you have for the web for that reason because it's important to, for your outlet and all of these traditional uh, outlets, whether it's broadcast or whether it's print, to, uh, to monetize where the eyeballs are. And so they have to have content and uh, they have to find ways to uh, deliver the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of profits, which I think Jim has already alluded to, that they have grown accustomed to on traditional platforms. But the first step is certainly having content in those places so it's it's paramount it's it's where the action is it's where it is where the um, where the consumer base is increasingly um, searching for for news I think um, I think uh, web and, and websites have have localized news considerably um, it, you know from from my perspective um, I, I uh, happen to use uh, Yahoo as my browser. Everybody uses something different. But there's content on Yahoo browser. And if there's a national story, it comes down. I mean, I, I'm on there, I don't know how many times a day, and I know I'm going to get it. But, uh, but what the web does is, provided you find your local outlet, is, is get you quickly to that local news. Um, and the ability to recognize that there was something here in Edinburgh, there was something in Erie, there is something uh, in your hometown that affects your life, and to be able to find that, yeah. um, I think the web has helped considerably with. So, we kind of talk about the the dark side of all this digital uh, era. You know, for a journalist, sometimes the whole get it now, get it on, and get it now. Even with Twitter, you may get to something, and your station wants you to be the first person to tweet it out. They don't care what it is. Get a picture and tweet it out. But as we've seen with some major events, there becomes problems with accuracy um, and, and having the whole story. So what do you see as some of the pitfalls of this digital, everyone wants it now on so many platforms um, for journalists and for the companies? The, the, the challenge is vetting the story, right? I mean, how, how, how accurate is it? How good is it? How real is it? Um, if you're uh, if you're immediately re-reporting it and it, you know, it, it goes uh, wherever, um, and it turns out to be wrong, I mean you know it's it is um, a serious challenge for um, those traditional news outlets that have always thought of themselves um, from you know day one uh, ABC, NBC, CBS Evening News. We are objective. We will only report what is correct. The newspapers, we are objective. We will only report what is correct. We'll do corrections um, tomorrow, uh, the next newscast, if, if something is slightly wrong. But you know, today, something could be really wrong. Um, uh, you know, and vetting is, a, I think, a serious challenge for the, uh, for the reporting industry. I think that's the biggest problem with the digital age is you see a lot of reporters who don't really they're not really reporting they they hear a rumor and they just throw it out there and then depending on what kind of following they have and what kind of reputation they have people just jump on it and then next thing you know it's everywhere and you see a lot of bad reporting you see a lot of incorrect reporting it, people think that if they get it first then that's going to make them they become part of the story but you know, a week from a week later how many people really remember who broke the story they're going to remember who 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 got it right and who developed it the best. I mean, that's, w that's what's going to keep people coming back. Breaking a story is great, but if you're wrong, I think more people might remember that than remember who actually broke the story. I yeah. think that's the biggest problem now is you have people. Some, I've seen some reporters, the, a fan will tweet at them on Twitter and they'll use that as a source. I mean, it just, it, there's a lot of pitfalls with it. See, I, I agree. I agree. The, you know, this is what I think. I think that um, 
because of what we're pointing out. The consumer, this consumer base, is increasingly sophisticated and smart about what they're receiving. And, and because of that, I, I really believe that ultimately quality will win, will rule the day. And, and what, I'm, what I'm getting at is this. The, the, the need for content has never been greater. The need for content is extraordinary because of the proliferation of all these digital platforms. We've been, everything we're talking about, the ability to get stuff out in a second. Anyone is a reporter, you can get this stuff out really fast. Uh, but that is because right now we're living in an era where the gadgets and the, the, the ways to distribute news and information are expanding as we speak. They're expanding so fast. And so our fascination is with the gadget and the fact that I can take a picture of what I'm eating right now and send it to my friend out in California, and all my friends, in fact, right, who, who are following me on Instagram can see what I'm eating right now. But Google didn't pay a billion dollars for Instagram because they believe that anyone, that people in perpetuity are really going to care what you're eating right now. They paid a billion dollars for it because it's an extraordinary platform and it's an extraordinary way to distribute a photo to however many people at one time. But, but they paid that money because ultimately, yeah, it's a platform, but ultimately the consumer is going to care about the content. You're going to get a little tired of a picture of what your, what your friend is eating. And, 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 and you're going to care about the quality of the content. And so I've, I'm a real believer whenever I hear people sort of bemoaning the, 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 the demise of quality journalism. Um, I'm a real believer in the fact that, uh, that these consumers will care about quality uh, uh, as the years go on. It doesn't mean that there still won't be, a, that there won't still be a lot of, uh, of, uh, of pap out there, but, but there will be a lot of good stuff because there is such an extraordinary need for content. Oh, Kevin and Jim, you kind of both touched on this a little bit with betting. Um, and Jim, maybe you, you may be able to answer this or talk a little bit about it. With CNN's I report with, mm -hmm. with Ferguson and um, somebody posted an I report saying that the police chief was throwing up a gang sign. Turned out it was a sign for his fraternity. But when those kind of things happen, when it comes, Exactly. <laughs> when it fraternity. comes to social media <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and, and a company like that, what, what can that do to their reputation? How are companies trying to figure this out? Because sometimes you, you get a video, it looks legitimate, sure. the person seems credible, and then you find out that it's a hoax or sure. it's, the information is not quite right. It's, you know, I, it, it, it's, it's a great question. Um, and it really depends on... Um, the size of the operation, um, you know, s someone like, s you know, the, the the networks we would recognize, the news news outlets, um, CNN, uh, CNBC, uh, Fox <coughs> News, to a, to a certain extent, you know, they they have a political bent, but um, they all kind of follow the same plan in terms of um, of traditional news gathering. They still have bureaus. They still have, um, you know, offices all over the world. Um, my my understanding, and again, I'm not, not on the really on the programming side of the business. I'm on the network side of the business. My understanding is that um, it has to go to the local bureau and it has to be checked out. Um, but as Kevin suggested before, I mean, and, and, and he's a blogger, right? I mean, you, you know, what, what, how, how big is his office? His office is him. I mean, it is, it's, it's his own personal integrity. And it's, it's kind of what, uh, what Brett referred to is, you know, I think anybody today that is going into journalism, be it uh, broadcast journalism or be it uh, print still or magazine, um, has to feel a real strong sense of personal integrity. Um, 
you know, we all have to hope for that because, uh, and as, as Brett also suggested, you know, we have to, those of us that view content have to recognize ourselves that it's possible um, that this isn't um, a, a true story. Um, it's kind yeah. of. I mean, do you all, do some of you think that you're getting, that you're pretty smart about knowing when a story's a hoax, stuff that you see? Do you yeah. think your friends are? Because how many of you see on Facebook when people repost stuff and you're like, come on. You, like, you really believe that? <laughs> Everyone has that friend. That, so you know somebody who falls victim to these fake stories. Then. Hey, do you guys know who Sumner Redstone is? S Sumner Redstone is a... He's, a, he's an old guy. He's an old guy. He's still <laughs> kicking them, he's, as far as we know. Uh, although I, last time I asked his corporate communications chief, I said, how's Sumner doing? He said, Sumner's been dead for years. I'm just propping him up. <laughs> but, but Sumner is the guy who's the chairman of Viacom and the chairman of CBS, because CBS was a part of Viacom, and he spun them off into two separate companies. But I mention him because... Sumner, among the many things that he's famous for, he famously said that content is king. And he said that, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. But I think it's still true today. And, uh, and, and I think that, uh, again, I think as the fascination with gadgets wanes or diminishes, the, the, the importance of content uh, um, will become more apparent. And that's why we see uh, the kinds of prices we see paid for uh, for content companies. Uh, it's ultimately, you have to have great content, right? Or the, the distribution platform is irrelevant. Uh, so, uh, so the thing that I talk to our students about and I remind our faculty of all the time is that at the end of the day, it's still one word after another, right? Whether it's a written word, whether you're standing in front of a camera, whether you're writing press releases, whether you're tweeting, I don't care what distribution platform you're using, you have to be an extraordinary communicator. You have to be able to produce great content. It's one word after another. No technology has found a way around that. <laughs> True. <laughs> Speaking of technology, what um, do you all think may be the next emerging technology, the next platform that companies, journalists are really going to be interested in as far as getting stories out, reaching their audiences? The, um, there, is a, there is a new product um, that, that is, is, was in testing um, with CNN for a year uh, and is now, um, I think, uh, available for sale, I'm not completely clear, called Data Miner. Has anyone heard of Data Miner? Data Miner is a company, a couple of guys, I think they were in New York, a um, couple of guys that um, developed a, uh, a technology that scans Twitter all day long for news and um, then pulls that news um, and provides it to outlets that pay them. Um, it, you know, I, I, I reference CNN again because I, I talk to them. Um, but that's how they got the Justin Bieber arrest story, hmm. um, and you know, and it, it's it's an interesting. And you know, at, not now that I've mentioned it, um, you know, we we don't talk much about how uh, what was once entertainment news or celebrity news is now hard news. Um, so there's and and the fact that. TMZ is the organization that released the second piece of the Ray Rice uh, elevator uh, footage that uh, was in the elevator. Um, but, um, it, you know, you, you asked about technology, and I'm sorry I'm getting off the subject. Okay. I mean, I think that it's, it's not technology as much as it is um, software in this case, but, um, you know, an ability, again, to, uh, to find that news within Twitter. As far as media companies go, I think uh, something that uh, Grantland.com, uh, Bill Simmons' website, they do their own, like, almost little TV shows or, like, little documentaries, like the Steve Nash coming back from uh, injury. That is what, I mean, they're really smart about the stuff they do, and then it, they've turned Bill Simmons' podcast into their own little, like, YouTube channel and just 
that's turned into uh, its own little entity on itself. I think the smart companies, that's the websites that are so desperate for page views and traffic and audience and ads and everything like that. I think that's, you're going to see more of that where it almost like a TV show on the side and just yeah. more content and smart content and documentaries and that kind of stuff. I think that you're going to see a lot more of that. Well, I think, um, um, well, I think in terms of technology, I would certainly say that uh, uh, the, the gadgets such as the Apple Watch, which was revealed recently and I think goes on sale in a few months, I think I, 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 I would certainly expect that to, um, if not their watch, uh, others like it, to, uh, to, um, to, to get some traction. Uh, you know, earlier tonight we were talking, I had mentioned earlier when we were having dinner uh, that I had the opportunity, one of the opportunities to uh, talk to Steve Jobs before he passed. And one of the things that I remember him talking about, this was shortly after the iPad was released. And he said that he had been working on a notebook many years earlier and then the uh, uh, mobile phones began to, to catch on so much that he put the notebook on the shelf and the prototype really became what became the iPhone, which of course is why the iPad and the iPhone are so very similar. Um, um, and, and the watch also, I think, was something that, that Apple and some others have been looking at for a long time. So I think, I expect there, there to be a lot of excitement around that gadget. Now in terms of, of news outlets themselves, I don't know if any of you uh, 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 are familiar with Vice Media. Do you know Vice? What? Well, one person shaking his head. I can tell you Vice, I would definitely watch Vice. Vice is, is, is really a, um, uh, is taking a different approach to covering tough news. I mean, in the idea with Vice, it's a guy, Shane Smith, they just raised some money from, I want to say, uh, Hearst, or maybe A&E, who owns A&E, maybe Disney and Hearst, I think. I think he raised money from those two entities, gave him a pretty high implied valuation of two or three billion dollars. They've been around a couple of years, but what they do is, like they recently have had stories, they've embedded reporters with ISIS, and now they do a combination of what I referred to earlier, sort of traditional reporting, but they also combine some of their coverage with native content, stuff that is sponsored by corporations, but some pretty hard-hitting stuff. And, um, and it can be a little racy. Uh, for example, I can't, I don't even know, maybe you guys can't access it. Our campus has it blocked. We have sort of filters. <laughs> I can't get it from my office. But, uh, but they're raising a lot of capital. They have a young demo, uh, which is important. I mean, look, that's kind of the, that's the, that's the thing that everyone's trying to figure out, how we get young people to pay attention to, to, to something other than entertainment news. As Jim pointed out, entertainment news is like a hardness. And, and they're doing it, and doing it with success. So I would, I, would, uh, I, would, I would pay attention to Vice. I, I, w I would also say, um, you know, in, in terms of technology, I, per se, I don't think much is going to change. I mean, the, the pipe is, is big enough. The pipe gets bigger and bigger. Um, uh, Google has, uh, has built uh, some uh, fiber to the home networks. I mean, typical f cable television network um, was fiber to the node and then fiber to the curb and that's kind of where it stops and then the coaxial cable goes into the to the home uh, Google in um, Kansas City built a um, a network and it is now uh, monetizing that and, and claims to be building it in 34 cities um, throughout the country that network is a hundred megabits a hundred and what you get from um, from Comcast is 16 or 50 or whatever, so or a thousand. I'm sorry, a thousand megabits. So the, the the their challenge they've suggested uh, in trade publications is they don't they can't fill the pipe. I mean, it's it's it. 
you, if people have to pay for that, um, they have no ability to use it. If you go on Google and you try their network, it'll do a comparison. It'll say, this is your cable and this is you, and we're going to download this picture. And it's like that. And cable is like that. Um, and telephone would be like that. And so, I mean, I think technology companies are just waiting for the next idea. It's more the idea. Um, it's more the people who come up with uh, the device media kinds of people. Maybe it's someone in this room. Um, but it's, it's, the, um, it's coming up with what people want. Um, it, that is, I think, the, the next direction, not the technology itself, because the technology exists to be able to provide it to people. Um, it just isn't there. Yeah, and I think as you'll see, the technology companies, again, uh, uh, buying more content, buying more programming. We see a company like we see, or an entrepreneur like Jeff Bezos buys the Washington Post, right? And I think that if, if Arthur Salzberger, the publisher of the New York Times, and his family decided that they were going to sell the New York Times tomorrow, even though Arthur says he'll never sell, well, <laughs> meanwhile, the, the stock is... Is, is shrinking every day. The market cap is shrinking every day, so he might change that tune. I think if he did, I think if he said tomorrow that I'm selling the paper and he called and he hired an investment bank, I think that that investment banker would, would you know, the, probably the first three calls would be to Google, to Facebook, uh, to who else? Some, um, some other digital media company that I'm not thinking of now, but the point is, those are the people who, A, have the capital, it would be Apple, people who have the capital, and people who have the distribution platforms. And, um, and so I think that's where we'll see more of the action in the, in the coming years, um, is again, more, of the, more consolidation of the uh, technology with the content. What do you all think is important for students to take away as they're getting ready to go into this digital workforce? I would say, I touched on it earlier, just the versatility is a huge thing. And another thing is, you hear this a lot, you're your own brand. I mean, we're all, in, in a way, because of social media, we all have a brand. And if you just have to be careful what you do with that. You, I mean, you can't tweet about the party you went to the night before if you want to get into a, depending on where you work or where you want to work. I mean, I've seen people get in trouble that way. And I see high school kids who just tweet incredibly inappropriate things. And at the time, it's, I mean, I'm sure if I was in high school and I had Twitter, I'd be doing the same thing. But it just nowadays, that doesn't go away unless you're going to go through and delete everything. And even then, people might have a screen cap of it. So. Just be careful what you do, and I mean, just remember, if you, depending on what you want to do with in your professional career, you are your own brand, and there are certain things that just aren't going to go away. I mean, social media makes everything's out there at all times. I'll tell you two got two things that that I think it would be it would be um, of value to keep in mind, and one I think is evident by this gentleman right here, and the fact that he has parlayed or trant or evolved from uh, being a uh, traditional sports reporter to being someone who is at a business publication and, uh, and can cover the business of sports. And I mention that because I can tell you that no matter what you're interested in in this industry, it's all business. It's all business. I don't care if you're interested in entertainment, if you're interested in music, journalism, or music, uh, being a publicist in music or the motion pictures or politics, it's all business. And the sooner you, you, you kind of wrap your, 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 your mind around that and, and, and really uh, uh, are willing to demystify business and understand business, the stronger journalist you will be. You will be greatly empowered if you really gain an understanding of, of business. And, and we were talking earlier about that and the fact that uh, as a sports reporter, you, you, you know, you, you, you so distinguish yourself. You know, I've for many years covered media and entertainment. 
And I was saying earlier tonight to Kevin that I could approach celebrities and athletes about stories that I wanted to do on them, and they loved it. They loved it because it, 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 they recognized that, that I had an understanding of what they do that was beyond the game or beyond the performance. And uh, so I think that that's one thing that I would encourage you all to, to really take into consideration. One last thing on that point, you know, for example, I don't know how many people are interested in being television journalists. Well, look, there are 24-7, there are news operations that go 24-7 at Fox Business, at CNBC, at Bloomberg, etc. So there are, there's a lot of opportunity there. And uh, so that's something that I would say think about, and I think related to that, something that you all should, should really uh, uh, um, pay attention to is big data, big data. And big data, what I mean by that is our ability to, to capture and aggregate data, which again is a result of the proliferation of digital media or digital platforms, right? And there are so many untapped and untold stories that exist within the world of big data, that exist within your ability to, to survey and poll and aggregate uh, <coughs> statistics and information. Uh, tremendous stories come out of that as a result of it. So I think that's something that we'll see as a growing trend uh, is the use of uh, data uh, it, within journalism. So I think those are two things to, to, uh, to certainly uh, to, uh, focus on. Um, my suggestion is, is a little bit the opposite, I guess. Um, if, if I had a suggestion, it would be um, experience life as much as you can before you report on life. Um, I was just, I, I'm joining the board of Colorado Open Lands. Um, it's, a, it's an organization in, in Colorado that uh, protects the wilderness. Um, and, you know, people um, provide, uh, put their land in an easement. In fact, one of the, one of the biggest easements today is, is Dean Singleton, who owns the Denver Post and, and otherwise a media group. Um, but um, uh, so that it's preserved in perpetuity for beauty and whatever else. I, I attended a, a panel where uh, he was speaking, and I, I, I haven't vetted this information, so excuse me. Um, but, but what he said was the number of visits of people under 30 to Yosemite uh, and Yellowstone National Parks in 2000 was a little over 20%. The number of visits by under 30s in 2013 was 6 percent. So, you know, all, our generation is trying to preserve land and, 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 and preserve experiences um, for you. And I'm certainly, I'm not suggesting because you are in a beautiful part of the country and I'm sure you all get out. I guess my advice is, uh, you know, experience life before you report on life, and um, you know, it it it. I, I guess I guess for me, <laughs> I, I really have a problem. You know, and I've got friends that you know will spend five hours tweeting on a sunny day. Um, I you know I'd rather be with my family. I'd rather you know be out. I would rather go to a show, do something cultural, whatever. Um, but I think you're a better reporter if you understand. Um, those aspects of life. No, you know, I'm, I'm being only half facetious. I say they need jobs, half facetious. I can totally relate to what you're saying. I, I have two daughters who are in college, and it drives me crazy. Like, for example, we, we were arriving about a year ago. They're, they're in the back seat of the car, and we're, I used to work in Orlando at the newspaper there, so we're arriving in Orlando, and I'm like t saying, over there is this, and they are, you know, it's Disney World, right? And then I'm pointing the stuff out and I look in the rearview mirror and they're both doing this. And I'm like, <laughs> you rather, you rather, you're more interested in someone else's reality here instead of your own reality, which, by the way, I just paid a lot for. <laughs> to, to so, so to, to Jim's you point. You will take that right. <laughs> you know, to Jim's point, uh, you know, place a premium on your own reality. My daughter 
Not Kim Kardashians. My daughter texts me from a rat pod and she's sick, so that's pretty scary to me. Oh. <laughs> well, now I want to open it up to questions from, from you all. So any questions that you have for any of us, feel free to, I guess I'll call on whoever you have a question. Uh, I'm wondering, do you, do you guys see any potential dark sides to this uh, social media explosion, I guess? Like, what, what would you say is the worst trend coming out of it? To me, it's inaccurate reporting. Mm -hmm. That's it what just, I was going to say. There's mm -hmm. a lot of bad information out there. When LeBron signed with the Cavs, the three three or four weeks that led up to it were the craziest I can ever remember in, in my <laughs> career. I mean, it was insane. There was a personal trainer in Cleveland that became a celebrity. He was tweet, he said he had an inside source with LeBron. He, he trained one of LeBron's best friends. And this guy was on every Cleveland radio station. He was on TV stations. <laughs> he became, fans actually thought that he was the go-to guy for certain LeBron information. It just, it's pretty scary. It just, people, some people just believe anything, and that's how inaccurate stuff gets out there. Or sometimes you'll have other reporters um, when you're maybe following a breaking story or following up on a story who they know that everyone's watching Twitter, so they maybe embellish what they have a little bit, which makes it appear like you may be getting beaten <laughs> and you're yeah, not. Yeah. And then you're spinning your wheels trying to find this unicorn that nobody has. Yeah. Because this person is saying, oh, I found this great story and I have all this stuff, when really they maybe rehashed a story yeah. from the week before with a new sound bite. But your boss is like, no, it's, it's here. That's what they're saying. And then you see it at 6 o'clock and you're like, I spent my whole yeah. day trying to find this, <laughs> this it's thing. Got, you know, it's got to be tough in your business to be a scoop reporter these days. It's I mean, yeah. There's it's so tough. much you, you competition. You can't say anything. There are just it's, so many outlets. You got the scoop, you, you better keep it quiet until, yeah. <laughs> until it goes on the air because otherwise someone else will get it. And then if, you get nervous it, about keeping it quiet until Because someone then. else may yeah. have it and they may tweet it first and then you're like, I, I've been sitting on this. You so. know, I think one of the other things that um, is, is unfortunate um, as a result of, of the way things have changed is that there are a lot of desktop reporters. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is people who simply don't get out. Now, you know, sports kind of forces people to get out. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Yeah. But, but increasingly, people do a lot of the reporting right there at the terminal oh, yeah. because they can access so many people yeah. and so many things. And I've, I've seen so many reporters who, you know, in fact, when you send them out, they're lost. <laughs> Um, and there's tremendous value when you start talking about, particularly you start talking about s real storytelling. Yeah, there, there, there is a lot to be gained from actually going out and getting real anecdotes and looking people in the eye. Kind of like uh, that Vice documentary where they embedded reporters with ISIS. Yes. They, they just got all that amazing raw content. That's right. That's right. I provide something genuinely affecting instead of just. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I think a dark side for people your age um, uh, is uh, that you're going to have to pay for this. That, that there, is, there is not a way for companies to develop content without high cost. Um, and they wait, and even if it's Netflix and Hulu and, and you know, it's something other than cable television, um, the costs for those people that, and, and I'm not really even talking about news, I'm talking about programming, period, uh, that provide you with uh, video, um, you know, are, are doing what they're doing to try to protect their revenue streams. I mean, CNN develops uh, uh, Go because uh, only the cable operator can, you said CNN Go, only the cable operator can provide it to you, and they know they're going to be paid by the cable operator, but then someone has to pay the cable operator. Um, and so those things, and, and um, I forget who it was that asked me earlier this evening, um, but you know, the, the don't don't assume that those sources that are free today and those sources that um, are lower cost today, like Hulu's and Netflix, um, aren't going to try to monetize their opportunities as well. And you know, it's. It, it's too bad, but it's just not free. Yeah. Any other questions? Back here. Like you were saying, like, uh, you were saying with uh, the last question, it was up to like the viewers and readers like, to interpret that information 
as well as absorb it. Because with, uh, like you said, with the uh, Twitter example, anyone can grab that first tweet and post a screen cap of it. But I was wondering, like, uh, if there was any sort of like uh, non like media new non media news source that was able to manipulate that sort of information. Like, if it wasn't if it wasn't a news source, then how else could uh, new media be dangerous? Like outside of the uh, news people. So you're saying if just like some random person tweets something out that's like a news item, how could that be dangerous? Or how could it be positive or negative? Okay. Like if news is able to like cover a certain event, then what can people do about it? Like, <coughs> there could be prejudices or uh, like say Ferguson. There was a media blackout regarding a specific event, but still there are people covering events. After, even after two months after it was covered on the news, there's still events going on in Ferguson. There's still showdowns. There's still people uh, politically volunteering their time into discussing and uh, talking about the event. So if media can't uh, catch up with the uh, Specific news organizations can't catch up with it, then can people be considered as their own news source, as autonomous, without like having to rely on news sources? Yeah, I think you're over time, I think they could be. It, 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 it just, you have to get people that, who trust you, and if, if you are reporting in Ferguson, even though you're not an actual reporter, if you're reporting things that you see in as time develops, maybe in a couple of days later, if you've been doing stuff that is consistently true and accurate and people are coming back to you for more, and you can end up developing your own, and you could be a source of information for people, yeah. It's, it's real user-generated content. And, and you know what, one day we'll see some user-generated content win a Pulitzer or some user-generated content win an Emmy or Peabody or something. It's bound to happen. So um, um, that's the upside of it. Uh, the downside, I think, is what we've talked about before, is being able to, um, to uh, distinguish between uh, what is good user-generated <coughs> content and what is not. I think with Ferguson, even, like the Huffington Post picked up some of these activists who were reporting um, pretty consistently and picked them up and actually was publishing their work um, on their website. But the thing about that sometimes too is also with vetting it, sometimes it can be biased if someone's so entrenched and especially if they're on one side of the issue with their reporting kind of relates to their agenda. Yeah. So Because they aren't journalists. Right. They're, <laughs> they're trying to push an agenda. But they did actually use some of the people they picked up to meetings where journalists weren't allowed, it was a, a blackout only community members, and they got these people who were reporting and were accurate to sit on the meeting and report what happened. So, um, so I definitely think that people can be their own source, and you know, sometimes major outlets will pick them up. Too. And it can really greatly impact the uh, you know, uh, major stories. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we saw that happen with uh, Mitt Romney right in the last election cycle when he was at a fundraising uh, fundraiser and someone had a camera or had some sort of video device, some sort of video camera, and, uh, and um, they captured video of him. So I don't remember exactly what he said, but it, it, was, a, it was an unfavorable story as a result. Um, and, um, and there are those times when, because cameras are everywhere, <laughs> you know, stories become so, so big, and the one that the one that uh, always sticks out in my mind is really kind of being the big, the, the beginning of that phenomena is the Rodney King beating, which was before you all were born. Right. And that was a video was, camera that, that was, was mounted on a police him. car. Yeah. And uh, my goodness, what a story that turned into and, and subsequent stories and events as a result of that video. Any other questions? That led to the LA riots, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You had a question? What would you recommend for 
new graduates or in the next few years of graduates as maybe more opportunistic entry modes into the field or specific professions within the field uh, that are growing that uh, younger people would have opportunity to quickly move along in and as you said like it's one business and knowing that you can transition from business to business within there um, from different modes and stuff of recording what would you say is a good entry point into that <coughs> Well, I'll take a shot. I think Kevin has, has, has alluded to that as well, and the necessity to be able to do a lot of things is, is really important. And so to be able to practice a craft across all of the platforms, uh, and I'm sure you guys hear a lot of that in your, in your classes here, um, and um, I think we've even heard Vanessa allude to that. She's a, she's a broadcast journalist. Uh, but we hear you talking about stories for the web, et cetera. So I think it's really important uh, that, uh, you know, people say it, and it may sound like uh, almost like a cliche to you, but it really is important that you be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to handle the, the written word well and to also uh, shoot and to also get in front of the camera and uh, to file really fast. Uh, for for the web and for digital outlets, so you, so you really do have to be uh, have a um, you have to be multi multi talented. Um, and and if I would think about maybe another area that I think there is opportunity, uh, you know, I mentioned business journalism. Uh, I think another area is is healthcare, healthcare journalism and communications, um, because it's. Uh, like digital media, it's an area that's uh, that's it's a sector of our economy that uh, is is really largely driving um, um, the uh, it, well, it's largely largely driving the economy, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities for people in public relations, um, in healthcare, um, and I think that uh, likewise there are opportunities for people who have. Uh, some level of expertise as journalist um, in, uh, in in healthcare as well. So if you talk about a specific area, that, that's something to think about. I think there's a lot of opportunities in websites. There's, I mean, a lot, as newspapers transition and as TV TV stations transition in this new marketplace, you see a lot of them either they spin off into having like their own little website company per se like the Cleveland Plain Dealer used to be this monstrous printed edition now they spun off and do it's like it's actually two separate entities they have the print edition which is the Plain Dealer but they actually have their own company called the Northeast Ohio Media Group and those are basically digital journalists most of them right out of college that come in and they get these they, they get these guys and girls a little bit cheaper than the old school journalists. They come in and they're writing three, four stories a day, and that's just the way it is now. You'll see a lot of that kind of stuff. Like ESPN is hiring writers pretty much for every professional sports team. I just, if you can get your foot in the door somewhere and and build up a reputation, and there's, I think if you want to be in writing websites, there's going to be a ton of opportunities. It's, it it just keeps growing and growing. And this is the other thing too. Graphic design and and coding. I mean, look, if you can get uh, some introduction to computer science and pick up some coding skills, you, I can assure you, if you can combine coding skills with content production, you are so extraordinarily marketable. And if you have those digital uh, digital graphics capabilities, again, along with storytelling. I mean, you guys understand why, right? You look at these various sites, you look at things on your mobile and mobile gadgets, and just like I talked about big, big data, right? So people look at big data, and instead of, for example, writing a story about poll results, what do they do? You can do a chart, right? You guys have probably learned about charticles or infographics, right? And so if you have that capability to tell that story through graphics, then you're extremely marketable 
but absolutely if you can if you can do some coding one of the things we just started at our school is a center for innovation in digital media and the idea with this center is to bring students from journalism and communications together with students from the school of computer science together with students from the school of business who are entrepreneurial it, uh, sh or many of whom are entrepreneurial by nature uh, so that they can learn a bit of each other's discipline and and I can tell you those of you who can combine those things the sky's the limit infographic is a buzzword in newsrooms so like, can you yes. make it move can you make yes. it do whatever I'm like I can't even get the picture <laughs> off the page <laughs> make it move so if you can do that it's definitely a good skill any other questions? I thought I saw some other hands. Uh, Jim, where does cable go? And w what happens to cable operators? You mentioned Google Fiber, and you're going to have a gigabyte connection in your house. Uh, so what? So we talked about the gatekeepers and journalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so aren't cable operators sort of those gatekeepers now? Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> directly delivered to consumers soon? Yeah. It's, uh, we were discussing this over dinner. Um, and. Um, you know, it's the, the you, you can kind of watch, and I'll use Comcast as an example. I mean, it's the biggest operator. It's probably what, every, what who everyone recognizes. Um, they moved from, um, from just being a network provider. Uh, and, you know, in the early days of cable television, that's what we claimed we were. Oh, you know, we, we don't edit anything. You know, we're just, we just pass it along if you don't, if you don't like it, you know, you got to talk to them. Um, just kind of a common carrier. Um, but Comcast has purchased programming. Uh, Comcast has purchased uh, a, a number of companies that uh, move data in different ways. Uh, they've purchased technology. Um, um, I was uh, uh, mentioning to the, the dean of your business school that, uh, you know, it, it, Back when I was in business school, the, 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 the tag was if the railroads um, uh, had thought of themselves as transportation companies, instead of railroads, they'd own the airlines. Um, I think the cable companies ha you know, are strong enough, recognize that they have uh, a, a, a pipe into the home. I mean, it's the last great network um, uh, that uh, uh, they and flexible enough that they'll move in whatever direction is necessary. And they might actually be, I mean, it, you know, as, as, as time provides, they may actually be um, just a network provider. You know, the, the, you'll get your internet, but you'll get your programming from someplace else. Um, you know, it, it is, programming is a seriously complicated game. And monetizing that, you know, cable operators are used to 40% margins, you know, that means uh, after all your expenses, you know, you have 40% profit, you know, of your, of, of every dollar. Um, except that that, you know, that continues to diminish and, you know, as you know, cable operators are going to charge you higher rates every month um, or every year. But, um, to, you know, to use, to, to use programming costs as an example, and I guess especially in your field, I'll, I'll explain that cable operator and, and and we've always known that and this is just kind of programming development we've always known that what people want most is sports what they want second most is uh, movies and what they want third most is news and every other entertainment piece falls after that so given that the reason that some people keep their cable service is because of sports um, a cable operator has to deal with the cost of sports. Um, and I'll use the L.A. Dodgers deal as an example. L.A. Dodgers were purchased by Magic Johnson and the, in, in the group, right, for, for something that was considered a large price. Forget about the L.A. Kings because that was considered to be an absorbent price. So they also co comes, comes with that is the, is the Dodgers Sports Network. They sold the rights for $8.3 billion over 25 years. $8.3 billion means they have $325 million a year 
coming in for just sports rights. But, you know, the, the cable operators in that market have to charge people something additionally for that. Um, but the Dodgers are not interested in that. They want, you know, they want to be on the basic service and they want to go to everybody. So, you know, to use an example of uh, a, a com comparable example, the, the Pirates, as you, you would all know the Pirates, right? This is kind of your, your space. Um, the Pirates have $230 million a year in total revenue. That's, uh, that's tickets, that's concessions, that's broadcast, that whatever. And only 20 million of that is broadcast. So what do you think the, the, the Pirates Network, and I'm not even sure what it is, but what do you think the Pirates Network is going to do um, when their contracts are up? You think, you think they're going to accept $20 million in revenue when, you know, when, the, the, uh, uh, when the Dodgers are getting... And, and granted, LA is a considerably bigger market, and we all know that you know different things are a different price. But you know, and what do you think the LA Kings are going to do? I mean, you know, Ballmer paid whatever for um, uh, for his team two billion dollars, uh, and along with that comes the network as well. And you know, he's got he's he, he's a businessman. He's going to look for ways to get that money back. So. Th then you become as a cable operator, and, and a cable operator, you know, is isn't going to eat that cost. It's going to so it's, it has to pass it on to the consumer, which means you lose some more subscribers. I mean, Comcast lost 144,000 subscribers. It's infinitesimal, I and mean, when you have 20 million subscribers, but but 144,000 subscribers last quarter. Um, so, you know that 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 uh, you know t times four is. Uh, is what six? Five hundred sixty. Yeah. So so it's uh, it, it, it's it, it starts to become a significant number. It, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, you know, I I think I don't think any of us should worry about um, Comcast going away, but they may not be what you consider to be a cable operator today, or or any other cable operator for that matter. But you know, as long as as long as is sports is going to drive your programming costs, um, and you know you even pay five dollars a month for for ESPN these days, um, and and uh, it you know there's I don't I don't know that that they can't they have to figure out a way to to uh, uh, to pass that along. I, I don't know if I answered your question, but you know it's it's a, a cable companies are in good shape. Um, not as in good a shape as the, you know, some of the, the, uh, the internet, some of the, uh, computer players. Um, you know, Apple has a, uh, market cap of something over $400 billion. Um, Comcast has a market cap of $124 billion. They still have plenty of dry powder, but, you know. But that, and so you just touched on the reason that there is concern over Comcast buying Time Warner Cable, which you all may know about. That creates a, they create an amazingly large company at that point, a juggernaut, and so there's concern about the extent to which they then have a monopoly and the ability to pass those costs on without uh, the consumer having enough options to do something else. Other questions? Last call. There's a hand. He's, he's not afraid to fail if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's a difficult question. Instead of meeting this week, my criticism of mass media class is coming here because I convinced Dan his time would be much better spent listening to you. Uh, in our class, we were discussing uh, how the record industry kind of set itself up for failure with CDs and then digital media. Customers aren't loyal to that. And you mentioned that um, the gates are down, the gatekeepers are down. So, um, did the media kind of set itself up too? Like, I don't know what brought the gates down because you, you know you said they're down, so apparently they were up. The Occupy movement and Arab Spring. Uh, I believe the news companies were caught basically trying to block that out and 
Keith Overman, you know, he's a political now he's back in sports. Um, so I guess my question is, is, you know, this big problem in the media, was it created by the media that, Oh. Well, I mean, I don't know if they, I don't know that the, the mainstream media entities tried to black any of that stuff out, but I do think that the mainstream entities were certainly surprised with the, 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 with the Arab uprising and the Occupy movement and the extent to which they did get extraordinary coverage without using mainstream media. And to your point, yes, that underscores the capability that digital media provided, right? And it indicated, made it quite clear that, uh, that, that the, the capability exists out there to distribute uh, a story without going through mainstream channels. So staying with your analogy in the music industry, there's no doubt that the same thing happened with the music industry. The music industry was totally caught by surprise. And it was a result of, it, 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 it wasn't so much because they put music on CDs. It was, it was because uh, digital uh, distribution uh, made it quite easy for some, some renegades to come in and find ways to distribute music without paying for it. And you know, that became kind of the, that became the cautionary tale in the industry. Everyone in all other, you know, across all other, uh, areas of media, whether it's motion pictures, motion picture industry, they've been, they're one, they've been pretty proactive about not falling victim to the same thing, but they also benefit from the fact that it requires so much capacity to, to steal a movie and distribute it, right? So it's not as easy as a song. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but other areas have been really proactive about not falling victim to the same thing the music industry uh, fell victim to. I do think that uh, that traditional media, however, I think they've been very, they were very slow yeah. to accept this reality. They got crushed. They, they really got crushed. You know, I used to laugh like a number of years back, whenever there was a story, if something came out, if there was some study or something that came out suggesting that this internet thing may not be as big a deal as we all think. New York Times put it on the front page <laughs> because they wanted to believe yeah. that it's not as big as we all think. So my point is there are a lot of heads stuck in the proverbial sand. Oh, yeah. and, and, and so I think you're right in that regard. And, and, and some, some, you know, some, some big places are paying a price for being real slow to accept the reality that, that things have irrevocably changed. It is direct. You're right. Oh, that's the yeah. process. <laughs> it will all increasingly be better and better uh, uh, curators. Of, uh, of, of information. Uh, that I believe, um, and I think I alluded to that earlier, I think that's happening to some extent. Uh, because you have to be. Because you have so much stuff coming at you and vying for your attention. I think you had a question up in the corner. Uh, yeah. Um, along the lines of Facebook, do you think the next big thing is going to be like um, Along, you know, I guess uh, like a social network or some sort of platform on the internet. It's a man with a man with a few dollars to invest. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we know it yet. I think we'll. I can't I, I even really keep up. I have a sister that's 18, and like she always has something new, and I'm like, I'm still on Twitter. I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out Twitter and Instagram. I, like, I mean, there's so many different things now. I think at least from a news perspective, I know like stations are just kind of latching on to trying to figure out ways to use Pinterest and ways to use Vine and ways to <laughs> figure out how to get reporter content. And there are a lot of places still trying to figure out should reporters own their Twitter or do we own their Twitter or what can you say or does your name need my call letters after it? 
on Twitter. So there's we're still kind of stuck. <laughs> but you know what's most amazing? <laughs> what's most amazing about that question is the answer can come in an instant. Right. I mean, it could be like you know something that you discover two days from now, and two months later, it's like everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what's that's what's yeah. It goes really, to market fast and cheap. Yeah, yeah. it's so. Uh, like Snapchat, that was pretty like. Snapchat was like that. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about it and then everybody had it. I mean, really, Instagram, like one year after they created it, one year after they launched it, sold for a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And who was it? Was it was it Snapchat? Who was it that turned down $3 billion? Facebook. No, no, no. It's somebody just recently. Yeah, someone recently yeah. turned down like $3 billion. It was, um, yeah, oh, it'll it come was. to me, but anyways. Amazing value created overnight. I had a similar question, not to take up too much more time, but uh, right along that line, since he asked that question, I want to know, since you guys have been in the industry just a little bit longer, and even Vanessa and you, um, kind of seeing the up and coming of everything and the action, what do you think is the most exciting thing coming out of journalism today that you see? evolving into what still excites you about it? Or does it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, for me, it's, you, you know, I mean, you choose at some point in your life um, to, to do well or to do good, right? If you want to do well, you become a stockbroker or, you know, or, or get in the financial industry. Uh, if you want to do good, you could be in education, you could be in, you know, social services, you could be a journalist. I mean, I, I think it's still exciting to me that, you know, that the journalists want to report to people. I mean, they want to inform people. They, they want to be helpful. Um, and, you know, I, I still, uh, I kind of still have one foot in media, even though, you know, I've kind of moved on to, to business because... Um, I believe in it. To me, it's that you have so many different avenues to, if you're in the storytelling, to tell that story. It's just before, I mean, and when I first started, when you went to a game or you went to an event or whatever, you wrote about it and it was in the paper the next day. Now, if you're developing a story and it's a big story, you can write a big story for the print edition, but you can also write three or four blogs about it. You can write a story for the website instantly and then develop it much better in the next couple of days for a bigger, a much bigger, deeper, big picture story for a print edition. It just, it gives you so many different ways that you can tell a story. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I, related to that, I, I get excited about a great yarn. I mean, I get excited still about a great story, a great narrative. And, and, and the thing that drives, the things that drive great narratives are terrific anecdotes and, and the good facts and uh, data and metrics to back them up. You know, like yesterday, one of my faculty members was in my office. She, she had worked in public relations for years and one of the industries that's big in our area is shipbuilding. And she was telling me about some consulting work that she had done at the shipyard with some of the builders out there. And she was making the point to me that it's a different world, you know, when you're, when, when you're inside the shipbuilding business. And she said, you know, for example, I was sitting in a meeting with a lot of mid-level executives, and one of the executives reached in his pocket, did like this, and flicked an eight-inch knife out, and started cleaning his nails with it. <laughs> so my reaction to that was, man, I wish I was telling a story on the shipyard because I would, I would, I would get so much mileage out of that anecdote. Those are the things that drive stories. And, and so I get excited about anecdotes and I get excited about, about things that really do provide the opportunity for a great yarn. I think it's the basic, you know, journalism concepts that everyone likes to build on, you know, like having so many more opportunities to, to be able to, to reel a story in when you can go on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and find people and find stories. That's exciting. And also I think 
for me, especially seeing uh, more content development online, is that if you want to tell a story and you don't have a platform, you can still tell your story. You can get a camera. You don't have to get a camera. You can get your phone and make a video and upload it on YouTube or Vine or Facebook or whatever and, you know, and reach millions of people and you don't need a news organization to back you. If you want to tell a good story, you can tell a good story and I think everyone's seen that, you know, on Facebook where you see these incredible stories that millions of people have shared that some random person yes. thought was a good story and decided to publish it. So I think that's exciting to me too is that, you know, if you have something and you don't have anyone to back you or if you're working somewhere and no one believes in your story, you can still do it and you can still share it with people and still tell a great story. So I think that's yes. pretty cool. Well, Any other? Thank you so much for your questions. I, uh, this, the best sign of an event like this is always not necessarily the size of the audience, but the <coughs> level of engagement. And I think that your, your questions were, were quite, quite impressive and indicate the caliber and the quality of this event. So um, our PRSSA board members have some small but special limited edition <laughs> gifts they want to present to our panelists <laughs> that were just created, believe it or not, this very day. And so let's, let's thank them all for their <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah.